これよりインターロップ基調講演 KB4 を開始させていただきます。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me back at Interop Tokyo. As you know, I enjoy coming to Japan. And I'm really glad to be here this week because I have not been in Japan for almost three months. I did fly through Japan one month ago, but I was not able to stay. Today, I want to tell you about the movement for SDN. And how far we have come since I spoke with you one year ago. We have come a long way in the SDN movement. It has spread globally, and I will tell you where and how. My main points are shown at the bottom the value proposition for network operators. When I use the term network operators, it can mean telecom service providers. Data center operators, cloud providers, or enterprises. I will tell you what the vendors are working on because they are working hard to deliver products to meet the demand of the network operators. And I will tell you what's happened to ONF in the last year, and a lot has happened in the last year. And our growth reflects the growth in the global investment. In SDN. Considering the operator motivations, I am pleased to report no change in the main business value of SDN. Either you save money or you make money, and the wise operators do both. They save in capital expense and they save even more in operating expense. And they use the agility that SDN provides to create new revenue producing services. One of the important measures is shown on the very bottom bullet the quality of experience. This will come up more and more as the customers of the network operators value the network. Based on the experience they personally receive. The specific opportunities for operators are becoming clearer than just save money or make money. Clearly, the ultimate benefit of SDN for operators is that they can program the networks to meet business objectives. So, programmability is really our ultimate goal. Through centralized policy management, modular operation support systems for the carriers, the centralized intelligence that reflects the control plane of the SDN model, allows for automated provisioning, reducing labor costs and errors, and vastly improved traffic engineering for network utilization. We will talk more about virtualizing network functions, VNFs. And the abstraction of the forwarding plane has led to surprises. In the optimized packet processing, we will talk about that later. And in general, when you remove the programmability and the intelligence from every complex networking device, put it in the control plane. And the application layer, 
the network devices become much simpler and much more efficient, and they become truly application independent. So we are strong advocates of an application independent infrastructure. This is the same thing John Healy referred to as the software defined infrastructure, where you have pools of resources, computing, networking, and storage that are composable under the direction of remote software so that the network behavior can change rapidly according to the needs of the applications. We do not expect the network infrastructure to change as often as the applications. And for network operators who serve consumers, those applications can change every day or every hour. We are pleased to see operator trials all over the world this year. These are just a few examples. We certainly know it in Japan that bandwidth on demand has been popular with NTT. We're starting to see Wi-Fi offload with a great demand coming from China. Content delivery for video services to optimize the quality of experience are being enhanced with SDN. I was speaking to an operator recently about how they are doing this now to cache the information and the content and the video as close to the consumer of it as possible. And that enhances their ability to charge for entertainment services. We know that video consumes a larger and larger fraction of network bandwidth, and it's valuable to the operator. And finally, as we instrument the network, we can, and, and we virtualize the network functions, operators can now sell the virtualized functions as a service, and they can sell the analytics, not just use them to improve the network operation. We are already seeing how collection and analyzing of network status and conditions enables real-time feedback into traffic engineering and quality of service. But it also becomes fertile ground for operators to charge for enhanced services to their customers. If you go down to the SDI showcase downstairs, you can look at SISE Networks. They are building analytics and monitoring uh, products that enable the operators not only to run their networks better, but to sell services to their customers. Others are doing as well. I'm proud to say that NTT Communications is still the world pioneer in offering open flow based SDN services as commercial offerings for the benefits that you see here of self-provisioning and bandwidth on demand. The service was launched already two years ago and is continuing to spread throughout the world and it is popular with enterprise customers. But NTT is also investing in new ways to develop the technology themselves. And they have a couple of notable efforts. You will see them downstairs. An open source controller called Ryu, developed at their Musashino laboratory, just west of Tokyo. And the Lagopus open source switch developed in the Yokosuka laboratory, just south, southwest of Tokyo. I've been to both laboratories this year. Ryu is targeted at service provider requirements. And Lagopus is interesting because it operates both with merchant silicon for the packet processing and without merchant silicon for packet processing, where all the packet processing is done in the CPU. These are both available as open source software packages. So the operator and vendor trends are sort of summarized here. I'll go into a couple of specific details on the next two slides. In the data center, we're seeing finally bare metal and white box switching the same way we have seen it for several years in servers. We have open source software and open source hardware. Carriers are doing proofs of concept for NFV. 
and they are implementing SDN not just in their own data center or for a cloud service to compete with Google or Amazon, but in their network as well, in the edge, the access, the aggregation, and the core networks. Enterprises would like to wash their hands of infrastructure. What they want is automation, orchestration, and centralized policy management, where the policy management is tied to the business priorities. We're seeing enterprises that now say, we get up to 80% of our software from open source, but the remaining 20% is how we make our money. New products are appearing on the market this year. Finally, some hardware OpenFlow 1.3 switches will appear. We've had 1.0 and not much beyond that. And as the physical infrastructure gets in place, it's now possible to have products that perform orchestration and management on top of that infrastructure, or as we say, the open flow substrate. Among the new services the carriers are offering are the ones I mentioned earlier, NFV as a service and analytics for sale. Some new business models appearing. One is the service and support of open source networking software. For years, people said, how does anyone make money on open source software? Well, look at what Red Hat has done. But now we have new kinds of open source software. And finally, a huge growth in the demand for education and training about SDN by individuals looking to upgrade their skills and companies looking to revive their technical employees and keep them relevant. The data center developments are in two categories, within and between data centers. At first, data centers said, oh, we like the overlay approach. We'll do some SDN at the edge and software, and we'll tunnel through the infrastructure that we can't change. Now they want to change that infrastructure, and underlays are becoming more popular. With the white box hardware, you can now remotely load a software image and give it its entire personality from operating system to protocol stacks under the control of a remote software loader. The major data center operators operate more than one data center. Google has 12 huge ones. Baidu has 32. Ask your favorite one. How do they interconnect those data centers? There are certainly lots of carrier services, but some of them are looking at dark fiber of their own procurement, available in many countries now, and a new forum called Open Source Optics that takes OpenFlow all the way down to the network element in an optical transport environment. That was launched in March at the Optical Fiber Conference. And between the data centers now, with centralized traffic engineering, as Google has demonstrated, you can raise the utilization of your expensive WAN links from 20-some percent to 90-some percent. With the carriers, they have long wanted a single way of controlling their packet and circuit networks and their optical networks. They are finally getting this. They're putting SDN in the WAN. They're putting it in the mobile networks. And they and their enterprise customers are putting SDN and OpenFlow in the wireless LAN. You can see it downstairs. Among their new services to large enterprises are elastic hybrid clouds. As the large enterprises build private clouds, but they're not large enough for their peak demand, they turn to the carriers to give them that elastic capacity and more and more are offering global enterprise content delivery networks, often in partnership with other operators. I will talk today about openness. It's in our name, but it's on many people's lips. We are open. We believe in openness. So open interfaces are important if they are chosen carefully.
I'm giving you three examples. And in each case, if you choose the place of the interface well, and everyone agrees on that interface because it's not worth fighting over, then you can have innovation above it and below it where it matters. OpenFlow is the standard protocol interface between the control plane and the forwarding plane. OpenFlow just does what it needs to do. It's a vendor neutral standard, but it has fostered tremendous innovation in the control plane, in network operating systems and features, and in the data plane in the variety of switches, hardware and software, and how they are implemented. It's been a tremendously useful interface, and we promote it, and we're continuing to standardize it because it meets the needs of operators and it is vendor neutral. Above that, we have the northbound interfaces between the control plane and the application. I have shown several of them here because there are many, and not just one per controller, but one for, per use case. We are working on the northbound interfaces with our friends in other organizations, including the um, UCI Forum and Open Daylight, because each use case defines certain information models of data that characterize the network in an abstract way to the applications and that characterize in an abstract way the needs of the applications for the network. It is my hope that each of these use cases will define a small number of key information models that can constitute a library that could be compiled in any combination to create an ideal northbound interface for a particular operator environment. And finally, much to our surprise, there's activity below the OpenFlow protocol down in the, in the forwarding plane as companies who make silicon chips are starting to expose the API to the software development kit of their hardware abstraction layer. This was unheard of a year ago. But several are exposing it. Some are talking about making it open source. And maybe someday we will have some industry agreement on a standard API to the SDKs while preserving the novelty of the different silicon solutions. When I say open, I mean three things. Published, standardized, and not controlled by a single party. If you hear claims of, we are open, ask them if their open interface or open design is controlled by a single party. And if it is, it's not the open that we like. Here we are in the world of software-defined networking, where everything is in software, and software is king. So the biggest surprise is the activity going on in hardware to implement switching. We have an infrastructure layer called the forwarding plane that is optimized now just for packet processing. Packets come in and they go out. How do you know where to put them? We've simplified the forwarding plane tremendously by removing the complex control to a logically centralized control plane. We are now seeing a battle in the forwarding plane for how best to process packets. For many years, all we had were custom ASICs. The last few years, we've seen growth in what's called merchant silicon, off-the-shelf switching chips that you can buy that do Ethernet uh, packet processing with some layer two and layer three fixed functions. Tremendous cost performance, but rigid in what they can do. We've seen challenges in getting those chips to do open flow beyond 1.0. They are now being challenged by network processors, either pipelined or run to completion, by FPGAs, the field programmable gate arrays, and by CPUs themselves, whether it's x86 or ARM or PowerPC, packet processing in CPUs at very high data rates, line rate at 10 gigabits, if you do it right. And how do you do it right? There are two factors. 
One is the proper use of multi-core chips. The other is the tuning and the tweaking of the Linux environment that is in the background of these CPUs. What do you do in the kernel? What do you do in user space? How do you avoid copying? Where is the data movement? Tremendous gains just in tuning Linux for packet processing. And with packet processing comes packet programming to take essentially merchant silicon, high performance, low cost chips and configure them for different series of tables in table type patterns. So you can actually compile and program the pipeline in an existing chip to have different behaviors. This comes from the control plane down to the chip. And along with it, we expect that the OpenFlow protocol will therefore become less specific to the protocol fields that the chips have to understand. We call it protocol independent or protocol oblivious forwarding. I don't think we'd had the term packet programming before, but we have it now. We are doing open networking in a much larger context of openness that I'm showing here. We have our open interfaces. We have our open protocols. I'll tell you about some open source software. But we're in cooperation with a larger part of the movement to democratize technology through open source and open interfaces. Some of the key ones down at the bottom, the Open Compute Project for open source hardware. They did this successfully for servers. They are doing it now for switches. ONI is the open network install environment. It's a bootloader that allows you to download a complete software image into bare metal or open source hardware. Open source switch software, we've had a variety of them around. Lagopus is probably the most highly capable one right now. Open source optics for the optical transport network. And then up in the controller above the OpenFlow protocol, Open Daylight, which David Meyer described, an open source effort driven by vendors. Ryu from NTT Communications. Onos from the Open Networking Laboratory at Stanford University targeting carrier requirements, and wide area network application. Floodlight's been around for a long time. A lot of people learn from Floodlight. The northbound APIs, mostly determined by industry as de facto standards, because they're so easy to modify and improve. And finally, as we get up into the application and orchestration layer for cloud computing, OpenStack, the obvious candidate, CloudStack as sort of a competitor, OpenCloud from the Open Networking Laboratory, and then all the layer four to seven virtualized network functions coming from Etsy NFV. These don't all work together very well yet, but we and others are working hard to make sure that they do. Every one of these other organizations is interested in SDN. We are trying to help them take full advantage of the benefits of SDN. Every spring, the Open Networking Foundation launches its new initiatives. These are ours for 2014. I call it simple as ABC. I already know what I'm going to call it next year, but I'm not telling you. I have mapped all of our activities into these three initiatives. I will describe some important ones on the next few slides. But the A is to advance open SDN. This is the importance of openness and true openness as I defined it a few moments ago. Building real open flow so that this vendor neutral protocol is available and interoperable. Operators and enterprises tell me, gee, I can't really buy it and make it work. And uh, chip vendors say, gee, I can't do the multiple tables very well. Well, we are helping with all of that and we're making tremendous progress. And then connecting users to SDN for the upper layer services and software that really, really matter to their businesses. So we have many activities there. Let me tell you about a few 
that have started just since I was here one year ago. Carrier grade SDN gives a whole new flavor to what carrier grade means. It no longer means five nines reliability in a box. SDN is not a box notion. It's an end-to-end -end service notion. It's to optimize the quality of experience for the consumer of the network service. These are some of the characterizations of carrier grade SDN. And if you look at these, you'll probably realize these sound very much like some IT infrastructure, some computing facility. Well, that's what networking is becoming, a computing facility with links. Our wireless and mobile working group. Boy, this is being driven hard from all over the world, including and perhaps especially from Asia. We have three projects, and we do these for a year, and we'll finish them, and then we'll do more projects. Using SDN to enhance the mobile packet core, the evolved packet core. Using SDN for wireless backhaul to reduce cost, increase utilization, and dramatically increase flexibility. And for the enterprise, finally unified management of fixed and wireless networks through SDN and OpenFlow, as you can see downstairs in the showcase. We have a layer four to seven group working on SDN-enabled service functions, these VNFs, virtualized network functions. Right now, these are implemented in expensive single-purpose appliances, and operators tell me that they have to buy as many of these appliances as they buy switches and routers. So they are virtualizing them, running them in commodity servers and even in VMs to do many of these functions. We are helping them do this with SDN so they can run in a centralized control plane and still govern the network behavior to implement the VNF. ONF this year established a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, with Etsy NFV. This group holds the responsibility for meeting our commitments to Etsy NFV, and we are doing that. Huge interest in optical transport. Our working group is very busy. And I will just tell you that the star project is the bottom one, the packet optical integration. It's been a dream of these operators to have unified control over their optical and packet networks. Layer zero, DWM, layer one, optical transport, and layer two and three, normal packet processing. This dream is coming true through SDN. When we started in ONF, we did not do open source software, but we are doing it now because the truth comes from showing me the software that works. So we do it to learn, to validate that what we have does work, and to help people by demonstrating that it can be done and to give them the tools to play with it themselves. We do not do commercial software. We don't compete with anyone who does. But we opened our own GitHub repository. Everything we do is released under an Apache 2.0 license. You can find it and play with it yourself. What goes in there? We had, uh, about a year ago, the launch of a competition for an open source open flow driver for a controller. We offered $50,000 in prize money. And we presented one of those big cardboard checks to the winner in March. That code is on our GitHub repository. We commissioned an OpenFlow application running on open daylight to do tapping. Tapping is when you identify a flow and you tell the OpenFlow switch not to switch according to that flow, just to tap it off and send a copy to an, an, 
analysis program somewhere in the control plane. It doesn't require an operator to change how they do forwarding yet. That's a big step for a lot of operators, but allows them to implement open flow, siphon off certain flows, and see what they learn from them. There are probably seven or eight of our members that offer commercial tapping applications. This one is not commercial, but it gave us experience in building an open flow app on open daylight. We published four blog posts on our website describing that experience. Just go to our website, opennetworking.org, and you can see them yourself. We are doing much more in conformance testing for frameworks and test cases. These will all go as we develop them onto our repository. And as we prototype the northbound interfaces that we're talking about, those two will be put out there for all to use <coughs> and experiment with. Last year, I came here and I said, our members have grown, membership has grown by 50%. Well, I'm coming here to tell you that our user and operator members have grown by 100%. They have doubled since a year ago. Most of the growth has been in Asia and the Pacific. And as our membership have, has grown uh, another 50% from just under 100 to just over 150. We have had one new member from Japan and 49 new members from other countries. We are particularly pleased, of course, to see more operators and users involved because it is their requirements that drive everything we do. We started a new membership category in January for startup companies, startup meaning less than two years since their date of incorporation, very early stage. But we have also reduced their membership dues from $30,000 per year to $1,000 per year. And already we have some two dozen startup members participating and bringing new ideas into ONF and into the SDN community. If you look closely at where these dots are, you will see something really wrong with this picture. There are no dots in Japan. Next year, when I come back, I want to see some dots in Japan. So please, start a company, pay $1,000, join ONF, and tell us something radical and new. Oops, wrong way. In conclusion, this whole movement is moving. It continues to move forward. Even the incumbents are coming along with it. The most leading operators are deploying pure SDN. Some of the others are running some kinds of software and orchestration above their legacy network equipment. I can understand this, but they won't be the leaders. The same is true for the vendors. Some are embracing the true open SDN with all of its benefits. Others are not quite so open. They don't offer the same benefits to the operators. So be careful when you hear the word open. But I'm pleased that the movement is moving forward, and the operators are especially happy to see that. The growth in ONF reflects the growth of the entire SDN movement in our numbers of members, our types of members, in the geographies from which they come, and in the technical program that has grown so much already again in the last year. I love coming to Japan. This has been the most advanced geography for SDN leadership for three years. There are challenges coming from other geographies very close. Japan has an opportunity now to reassert its global leadership in SDN. Tell me what you're doing. Let us know if we can help. We want to make this successful. We like it when you lead. Please continue to do so. Thank you for your kind attention.
皆様ご清聴ありがとうございました以上をもちまして本日の全プログラムを終了とさせていただきます。